Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives. The only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening. And now, enjoy the show. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I don't know about you... But to me, the tinkling sound of a music box has always charmed and soothed me, conjuring up pleasant memories and the balm of sweet nostalgia. It still does, in spite of this story. But if it sends a chill through you, don't, please, blame it on music boxes in general. Just on this one and its haunting tune that struck a chord from the past that stirred up something infinitely more gruesome and deadly than nostalgia. Oh, Susanna, we're so lucky. This wonderful house. The future is a dream almost come true already. Do you like your birthday present? I love this music box. As I love you, Hank. Everything you do for me. Until I found the past coming up to haunt me. What do you mean? I don't know. It's just the music box. As soon as it started to play, my my eyes were drawn away down to the end of the garden path. To the summer house. And to the girl in the crinoline dress who's dancing there. What girl? I can't see anyone. I was afraid you might say that. Somehow I know she isn't really there. She has to be a ghost. But why would she want to haunt me? Our mystery drama, The Special Undertaking, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Jada Rowland and Don Scardino. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. I was reminded of this story a week or so ago when I picked up the morning paper and read that a small town was advertising for a doctor and willing to finance him and as many partners as he could attract in setting up a clinic. In outlying areas, medical men, general practitioners, are always in demand today. How much more so in the last century? Which is how the newly married Dr. Henry Fleming and his bride Susanna came to Huntington House some 100 years ago via the new Union Pacific Railroad, which had finally linked the East with the West. Do I have the honor of addressing Mrs. Fleming? Yes, sir. I'm Buford Hughes. Allow me to assist you. Ezra, get the ladies' carpet bag. Yes, sir. I'll relieve you of that bag, ma'am. Why, thank you. That's Mr. Ezra Whitfield, Beaver City's most prominent lawyer, in more ways than one. <laughs> they say success goes to a man's head. In Ezra's case, it went to his waistline. There we are, ma'am. And you'd be our new doctor, sir. Brand spanking new, sir. Just graduated out of medical school. Ah, but from Harvard. Hey, what about our baggage? No, don't you worry, Mrs. Ferry. Well, I'd like to check and, and make sure our trunks are there. Ah, ma'am, I think it's more appropriate for Ezra to help you in that area. Well, I make your husband as welcome as I can. Why, sure, Mrs. Fleming. I can see your trunks are all off. Just go check them over. Okay, honey? This is my job. <laughs> That's a fine young woman, sir. Eminently equipped to be a doctor's wife. Or anyone's. Susanna is one of a kind. Mm-hmm. I support your opinion. Just as soon as the missus had checked out your belongings, I have a wagon waiting to take them to your house. I also have a rig so that we can stop by the bank and sign our agreements. I think Susanna is a bit worn out. Could we perhaps get settled first and and then the papers? My dear boy, I'm sorry. 
I, I should say doctor. Forgive me. <laughs> uh, it's all right. I'm young, but I have knowledge. Don't worry. Well, I have no worries about your abilities after our long correspondence. And I don't want to lose you. You are needed here. We'll all just try to put out and make you feel at home right here. Well, now, sir, there she is, Huntington House. Oh, Hank, right on the ridge. It's beautiful, isn't it? Oh, it surely is. The house certainly is big enough. Well, we're only going to be using a corner of it. The rest is for a clinic, as we planned. I hope we can get some other doctors to fill it up. <laughs> you leave that to me, ma'am. Beaver City's made me a very rich man. I want to plow some of my good luck back into it. And that's why I advertised in the East to get a doctor out here. I'll try not to make you sorry for your generosity in any way. Ooh, easy now. Right before your front door. Oh, Hank, I'm scared. It... It looks so big. Sure, honey. That's the point. It's the beginning of a hospital that someday the whole West is going to talk about. The whole country. What are you mumbling about, darling? Oh, nothing, Hank. I'll, I'll tell you later. Let's go have a look at our new home. I calculate, with you tired and all after your journey, I should have taken you straight into the house. But with the light going, I wanted to see a little of the grounds. It's amazing. I can't believe the house has been empty all that time. After 15 years, I expected a jungle. No, there's been a housekeeper here all these years. Mrs. Bunter. And for years, her son kept the outside of the place. Oh, Hank. Look at that little summer house down at the end of the path. Isn't it lovely? Oh, it sure is, Susanna. I want to go there right now. Mm, it's almost sundown. i let it wait if I were you, Mrs. Fleming. Why? Why, because it ain't going to go away. And I can smell that Mrs. Bunter has supper about ready. I'm sure you must be hungry after the long trip. I know I am. Hungry as a bear. Come on, honey. It can't be all that important. No, of course not. Just a silly whim, but... Funny how it draws me. As though someone was begging me to meet them there. <laughs> and so there is. Me. But by moonlight. It's a perfect place for young lovers, wouldn't you say, Mr. Hughes? Hmm, I reckon that depends on the point of view. Well, shall we travel on in and say howdy to Ellen Bunter? By all means. Don't forget to come back. Susanna. <sighs> are you coming? Yes. Yes, Hank. Just stay close to me. And don't leave me alone. My, what pretty clothes you have, Mrs. Fleming. Boston must be quite a city. Why, yes, Mrs. Bunter. It is. It's a beautiful town. I'm surprised you ever come away from there out here to the west. If I was you, I'd pick up my skirts and get right back there. Why? Whatever you, do you mean? Why, well, there's things best not talked about. I'm just saying what I think has to be said. You sound as if you don't want us here. There's a black shadow lays over this house, Mrs. Fleming. And I don't want nobody else should lose their light under it. Special ways, no two nice young'uns like you. But please, don't say nothing to Mr. Buford about what I said. Wouldn't want to lose my job. Well, we can hardly just leave it at that. I'd like to know what you mean. I promise to tell you as soon as I can. But right now, got to go get supper on the table. I can't get over that cellar. Why, it's almost set up for a clinic already. But Mr. Huntington wasn't a doctor. <laughs> no, son. He sure wasn't that. Well, what did he do? Well, he mostly made money. Yes, sir. He looked to be about the richest man in this part of the country once. He used to raise cattle. Then he found a gold mine right here on his own property. Over the other side of the ridge over there. Mm. Is it still active? No. Bain ran out 20 years ago. But not before he piled up a bundle. I should know I was his banker. Ah, yes. Uh, 
Carson Huntington retired before he was 40. What did he do with himself then? Well, mainly he devoted himself to being a father. But he liked hunting real good. And you've only got to take a look around the walls to see where that led him to. You mean all the stuffed heads? Mm. Moose, buffalo, deer that are all over the place? He liked to collect them? More than that. He stuffed them all himself. Built himself all those tile rooms downstairs and worked just like a doctor in a white coat and all. Ah, a taxidermist, eh? Uh, more than that. You know how one thing leads to another, and, uh... Yeah, well, here comes your lady, and I must leave you to your supper. I was just going to ask you if you would join us. Mrs. Bunter tells me there's enough for you. And Mr. Whitfield, too. If you cook like that every night, Mrs. Bunter, I may just abandon my wife. Oh, thank you, sir. But I'm sure she's a mighty fine cook herself. Oh, matter of fact, you wouldn't think of it to look at her, but she is. And a housekeeper. <laughs> sure is good to see love lighting up this gloomy old place again. Just like the good old days, Buford. Huh? Mm, uh, yes, Ezra. But let's not go digging into the past. These two young folk represent the future. They're not interested in what's been. Oh, but we are. Uh, at least I am. Oh, so am I. I'll just take the tray out to the kitchen. I'll bring the coffee in soon. Poor Ellen. No wonder she doesn't want to listen to... Ezra... You talk too much. What'd I say? Nothing much so far. But usually too much. <sighs> I reckon I have to tell you a little about the house. But it's better for you to get it from me than from some old windbag like Ezra. Oh, tarnation, Buford. That's no way to talk. I tell you what it is, Mrs. Fleming. A house stays empty like this one did for over 15 years. And people start to build legends. Even a dried up old lawyer like Ezra here. Now, I'm a banker, a businessman. I give you the plain facts. We'd appreciate that, sir. I'd like to hear the legends. Well, let's start with the facts. It's about 60 years back that Carson married Sarah. 62, almost to the day. Well, you're old enough to remember exactly. It was before my time. I just opened my office, and Carson Huntington was one of my first clients. His folks had left him quite a spread, and he sold off enough cattle to build this big mansion for Sarah. Oh, she was a beauty, all right. And well fixed herself. That was some wedding. No, we don't have to go into every detail. I only mention it because they were so happy, those two. Just like these young'uns. And how could they have known the tragedy that was to be the most part of their lives? Tragedy? I suppose 20 years longing for a child and never being able to produce one isn't tragedy enough. I suppose when Rachel did come to him, her being born premature and... Blind and mute wasn't tragedy. I suppose Rachel's death That's was... enough, Ezra. No, please. We'd like to know. No, what Ezra says was true. Sarah did have a baby, too late in life. A little wisp of a girl who was blind and mute. They doted on her, devoted 16 years of their lives to bringing her up. Pampered and coddled her like she was made of China. They were recluses here and saw few people. When Rachel was 16, she fell in love. With Ellen Bunter's son, Elisha. Lost at Chickamauga and the war between the states, rest his soul. Lord rot it, you mean. He was in his 20s, and he just took advantage of the poor little thing. And naturally, it was an unsuitable match from any point of view. So the boy was fired by Carson and ran off to join the army. Rachel took it real hard, thinking he'd run off on her because of her, her well, deficiencies. And went into a decline and died from a kind of colic. Broken heart, more likely. Yeah, if any hearts were broken, it was Sarah and Carlson's. And after the burial, they holed themselves away here at Huntington House. And no one saw hide nor hair of them for a year. And then one day, suddenly, unexpectedly, they both died. Like a bolt from the blue. Mm, he means that quite literally. They were on their way to church on the anniversary of Rachel's death and pulled under a tree to escape a sudden thunderstorm. And the tree was struck by lightning, and both of them were killed. How awful. Yes. There were no relatives. And the will specified that the house was to be kept and maintained in perpetuum. Yes. Now, I think Ezra and I should mosey along and let you settle in. <laughs> Mr. Whitfield, and drive carefully. 
Ooh, come on. Bedtime. Oh, look at the moon. Isn't it lovely? Not when I'm so tired. I can't even open my eyes to see it. You're not that tired. Maybe you had too much wine. Let's walk down to that that little summer house. Oh, oh come on. Have a heart, honey. What do you expect to find there? I don't know. Well, you're not going to find out tonight. Come on. I'm taking you up to bed. Yes, darling. Oh, take me to bed and warm me and hold me. And never, never let me go. Susanna finally fell asleep, shutting her ears against that still, small voice in her head. Tomorrow, she will talk to Hank about it and about Huntington House. Outdoors, the moon is at its zenith. Does something move strangely in the shadows? And if you strain your ears, can you hear the sound of a music box? I'll return shortly with Act Two. Just before dawn, with the moon sloping down the sky, the last of the full moon. In the strange new bed in Huntington House, Dr. Henry Fleming lies sleeping gently. Beside him, Susanna stirs with little whimpers as that importunate voice penetrates her sleep. you and I want. Well, you mean you want to to leave? You know we can't do that. You've tied up your whole future here. I've tied up my whole future with you. That comes first. But why? What is it don't you like here? Uh, all the sad history which is buried in the past, as Mr. Hughes said? It isn't buried in the past. No matter what he says. What does that mean? Since the first moment I got here last night... There's a voice. Voice? A young girl's voice. That calls to me, speaks to me. Just to you alone? I guess, if you haven't heard it. Well, so that's why you've been so funny a couple of times. Well, what does this voice say? Nothing, really. Just calling me to help and to come to her. Susie. Oh, I always mistrust your motives when you call me that. Well, don't this time. I just wanted to say we were both dead tired after a ten-day journey across the country. Nothing about last night was wholly real. Our life in the West starts as of this morning. Now, let's give it a day or two so we can really judge it. Then if it's wrong or, or your voices still speak to you, I promise we'll face up to it. You don't believe me. And perhaps you're right. This morning it was so faint. I could scarcely hear it. All right, Hank, darling. Let's forget about me. And concentrate on your life. Oh, Ellen. I mean, Mrs. Bunter. An apron full of fresh eggs. Every morning, ma'am, if you want them. We have a power of layers. Can I help fix breakfast? Oh, a lady like you has no place in the kitchen. I want to be here. And do I have to call you Mrs. Bunter? Couldn't it be just Ellen and Susanna or Susan or whatever you want to call me? You're a sweet child. And it's good to see a bright, fresh face here. But is it wise for us to be that close? Well, I don't care if it's wise. I need a friend. And someone to answer some of my questions. All right, little one. You have a friend. I'm so glad. 
Yesterday, I... I thought you would have done anything to get me out of here. I should be ashamed, I suppose. This house has been my life, but for all the tragedy, it has treated me well enough. Then why do you resent my coming here? It isn't you, dear heart. It's only that I thought the past was buried. Why don't you accept your good fortune as it is and leave the ghost of yesterday buried and forgotten? I will. If they leave me alone. No, I don't know what you're talking about. That's two of us. Yesterday, when there was time, you said you would explain about the black shadows that lie over this house. It isn't the time yet. Certain people would be judged wrong. Rachel Huntington, for example? What do you know of her? Only that she died mysteriously. And that she loved your son. My son. My son that was... A fine, true boy then, until he was cast out. What happened? I neither excuse him or blame him. They might have found a life together. Instead, my Elisha was thrown out, sent to be cannon fodder. Because two children of love had committed the oldest sin in the world. A sin that wedlock would have wiped out. I didn't realize that. You mean that Rachel... I didn't know it myself. Till after Elisha had been sent away. For sure. Till after her death when I talked to Mrs. Huntington. Would you tell me what you were hinting at last night? I think you ought to go from here. Now. While the going's good. It's funny. I get a feeling you're thinking less of me than you are of yourself. Maybe you're the one who should leave. Oh, oh no. Please. Please don't send me away. I promise. If you promise to let me stay, I won't open my mouth again. <laughs> It's just so strange about Mrs. Bunter, Hank. I mean, you know I'm sensitive to people. <laughs> Don't I just, my little witch, or medium, or whatever you are? No. Don't talk about me like that. Darling, I didn't mean anything. It's just that you are psychic, clairvoyant. You have some kind of perception that's extra, more than other people's. You do believe that, don't you? Even if you're a doctor. Too many things have happened in our lives for me not to. Remember how you woke me, crying to tell me that my father was in danger? Yes. And we found out afterward it was exactly the moment he'd had his heart attack. I don't always see bad things. Of course not. You also told me the moment our child started to grow inside you. Long before any doctor could have known. Darling, I believe in your... your intuitions. What about the voice you thought you heard when we first came here? Oh, there hasn't been a hint of that for a month. I don't know what it was. What's that you have in your hand? Oh, it's funny. I was poking around on the second floor uh, in that sort of special little wing. The one you were thinking about for the laboratory and all the new microscopic equipment for research. Yeah. Well, that's where I found this box, just lying in the middle of the floor. What is it? It's a music box. <gasps> An old one that, that doesn't work. Are you sure? Well, it's probably just rusted, needs some oil. Could you fix it? Maybe. I'm not sure I want to. I want you to. That's a strange tone from you. Oh, I didn't mean... Please, Hank. I'd like you to try to make it work. If you'll tell me why it's so important. The voice I thought I heard when we first came here? When it spoke to me far away in the background, a music box was playing. I see. Is that why you hesitate? Partly... Something tells me I should take this lovely old walnut box and bury it in the ground or the deepest lake I can find. Why? Well, the room where I found it had only one window, dark and shaded by the vines which clamber all over the house. The wing must have been closed off for years. The dust was an inch thick. It was eerie that everywhere I went, I left my footprints outlined clearly behind me. Wait till Mrs. Bunter and I get in there with some mops and a broom. We'll chase the dirt out and wipe out your footprints. Oh, I'm sure you will. There's only one thing you can't wipe out. What's that? The spot where the box was lying, covered with cobwebs. Well, why can't we clean that up, too? Because when I picked it up, there was no depression for all its weight. No mark to show it had lain there for any time at all. 
except for the fact that it lay in the center of the room, with no footprints in the dust coming or going and could have been placed there yesterday or this morning before I entered the room. Do you still want me to see if I can make it play its song again? Hank? Who else? Oh, it could have been Mrs. Bunter. Look at that full red moon. Isn't it gorgeous? Yes. I have a little present for you. Oh, what? Your music box. It plays now. Let me hear. Very well. Do you remember something? What? Today is your birthday. That's why I worked so hard to have this ready for you. I know it isn't much of a present, but this year, with all the other expenses and... What is it? That melody. You know it? That's the song that was playing behind the ghost voice that... What is it, darling? Look. Where? At the summer house. Don't you see her? Th there's nobody there. Yes, there is. See how she floats and and, and spins with her, her crinoline swirling around her. She's calling to me. I can hear her. I've got to go to her. Come with me, Hank. Come with me. Don't worry, Susanna. I won't let you out of my sight. You see? There's no one here. But there was. There still is. Only... What happened to the music box? It ran down. Wind it up. No. I should never have fixed it so that it would play. It doesn't matter. She would have reached me anyway. Wait. Find me. Come to me, Susanna. It's Rachel. How? The music box. The music box. Was she just talking to you? The ghost? Yes. It was Rachel. But she's been... How could she talk to you? She was amused. I don't know. I don't think she wants to hurt me. She wants me to help. Help her to do what? How? I don't know. I'm not even sure it's a, a ghost that's trying to reach me. That's what scares me more than anything. Susie, you can't be serious. What are you trying to say? There's something terribly wrong about it all, darling. And somehow Mrs. Bunter is mixed up in it. I know she is. In what way? You know I like to keep charge of household accounts and things. The supplies, the towels and linens. Everything that goes with the house. Too many things are missing. In too obvious a pattern. Hank, there's someone living in this house we don't know about. And you think... What can I think? You mean that Rachel never died? That somehow she's still alive? I think she's not in her grave. And that she is calling me for help to get her out of some captivity that has chained her for 15 years. Somehow, I've got to find a way to help her. There's an interesting corner to turn in a story, to find that a ghost, a well-established ghost, may not be one after all. Something we all must find out when I return with Act Three. The full moon passes for a moment behind clouds, allowing Hank a worried frown which he can conceal from his wife. His mind is a spinning mixture of thoughts he is fighting to keep from coagulating. They must be kept separate to evaluate them. Is Susanna simply suffering from the vagaries of a lady in her, as would have been said in those times, interesting condition? Or is there really an extra presence hidden in Huntington House? If Rachel, if that's who it is, won't reveal herself to us openly, how can we find a way to help her? You don't think I'm crazy, do you, Hank? There is some mystery that's got to be cleared away before we can ever live in this house. But you really believe it's possible that someone or, or something is hiding here? Someone. From the amount it uses up in food and linen and towels. But at the same time, something that isn't natural. 
It's supernatural. Huh? What is it? Oh, it's just the moon coming out from behind the clouds again. As bright as some enormous chandelier hung in the sky. If only I... Wait. She said the music box. Start it again, dear. Quick, before the moon goes behind the clouds. You sure you want to? Yes, yes, quickly. Okay. Well? Look. There she is. Dancing. Where? Up, up the path, towards the front door. And she's... She's beckoning for us to come. She... Oh. What is it? Oh, the moon behind the clouds again. I can't see. Come on, let's go. There's no one here. The front door's opening. What happened to the music box? It stopped. I don't know why. Oh, there you are, Dr. Fleming. What is it, Ellen? What's wrong? I think he's dying. Please, could you come to him and try to save his life? Even if he isn't worth it. Save whose life? My son. I'll show you where he is. He's hiding out in the barn. Hold the lantern higher, Mrs. Bunder. That's it. Hurt there? Some. How about here? Oh, that hurts pretty good. He's burning up with fever. We've got to get him up to the house, see if we can't bring it down. Oh, oh no, sir. You bring me up to the house and you're just signing my death warrant. What's he talking about? There's a wanted poster out for him. Murder and highway robbery. He killed a United States Marshal making his getaway up Cheyenne Way. If I can't get him where I can treat him properly, it won't be the government signs your son's death warrant. This is your son, Ellen? More is the shame. Yes. But I thought he was dead in the Civil War. I'd take more pride in him if he had been. But he deserted the army to take up with a bunch of cutthroats and outlaws robbing and stealing and killing. Did he got wounded. He came crawling home to me to beg me to save his life. What could I do? He is. He was my only child. I didn't know how to turn my back on him. I should never put you on the spot, Ma. I don't deserve nothing better than I got. A bullet in the gut. I should have let it take me in its own good time. Just what it's doing. Oh, no. I was, I was wide open and bleeding like a stuck pig when I crawled in here over a month ago. Ma nursed me back to health, and, and the wound closed up. And then this damn fever got to me. The fever is because you still have that bullet locked up inside you. It's festering. You have peritonitis. And the poison will kill you unless I get that bullet out. You were, you a real doctor? I have a sheepskin says I am. And that means by law, you're going to have to let them know I'm still alive. And I'm going to have to hang just the same. We can talk about that later. Oh, when... no, sir. Johnny Law, don't get me. Now everybody stay right where they are. Nice and easy while I get out of here. Elisha! Ain't no use trying to reach for me. You lost me a long time ago. Just like I lost myself. The only thing outside of you I'm really sorry for is... I never should have hurt Rachel. The funny thing is, I, I really loved her. If only we'd ever had a chance. Oh, Mom, I wish I... I could have done better by you and, and, and Rachel. Lysha! Hush, Mrs. Bunter. Let my husband handle it. I'm sorry. It was too late. This time he's... He's really dead. <laughs> There's nothing much I can do, Mrs. Bunter. I'll have to ride in and tell the authorities. There was no real excuse for all the things he'd done the past few years. If he'd ever had the chance, he might have amounted to something. You should have seen him with Rachel. Oh, don't torture yourself with memories. Well, I can with the good ones. In spite of the misfortunes birth brought her, she was so bright and full of the joy of life. You should have seen her dance. Dance? 
She was blind, wasn't she? Oh, that seemed to make no difference. She could hear, sharp as a bat. I always said what a pity it was they never got her a pianoforte for her to learn to play by herself. But they never did. Just music boxes? Oh, yes. Like this? Oh, yes. That looks like one of them. That box does seem familiar. Ellen, are you sure Rachel Huntingdon is dead? Well, I'm sure she is. I know it. To keep her from running after my Elijah. They poisoned her. What? Did you actually see her dead? They'd sent me away. And then... Then she died so sudden. And I came to the funeral and I stood in the back so it wouldn't be seen. And I saw the coffin lowered into the ground and the dirt covering it. And the minister commending her to heaven. Is that what you mean, Miss Susan? I, I don't know what I mean. And this isn't any time to talk about it. First of all, let's go get the minister and see your son decently buried. <laughs> You sure you don't want to come with me? No, darling. I really think I ought to stay with poor Ellen. You're not afraid of anything? Why should I be? Well, you were the one who sensed another presence in the house. But that's all over. Now we know it was Ellen's son. Only that's not what you were hearing. You were hearing a woman's voice calling to you. To help the man she loved, who just died. And who must be with her now. There's nothing to be afraid of anymore. I, I don't know. I'm not sure I should leave you alone. No, don't be silly. You'll be back in an hour or so. And even if poor little Rachel wanted to haunt me, she couldn't mean me any harm. Well, it's a dark night. And even if she wanted to, she only seems to come when the moon is bright. Promise me you'll go straight to bed, lock the door, and wait for me. I will. Hurry, darling. Like the wind. You go straight upstairs. Bye, Susanna. Bye, Hank. Aren't you going up to bed, Ellen? Yes, I suppose so. I don't know what for. I won't sleep. You must. Come on. We'll have a hot toddy in the kitchen and then go up together. <laughs> Huntington should have left her alone. She'd been better off with him the way things happened. Lord knows, he'd have been better off with her. They loved her and wanted to protect her. Would have been the same if she'd been normal. They waited too long to have a child. When at last she came to them, they smothered her. The only freedom she ever had was her dancing and her music boxes. Like this one. Where'd you find that? I didn't. Hank did. In the little room on the top floor of the wing. Rachel's old room. But that part of the house has been shut up ever since I came back. That was part of what it said in the will. Why did you turn that on? I didn't. It just started by itself. I know that tune. I thought you said you couldn't tell one tune from another. I can that one. It was her favorite. Turn it off. That's better. I don't want to be reminded of my poor little Rachel tonight. I... What is it, Miss Susan? Shh. She's calling me again. Come, Susan. Come. No, you must. I want to lie with my lover. Where are you going? Where the music box is leading me. This time I cannot fail her. Don't go in there. That's Miss Rachel's old room. This is where she bids me come. Hold your candle higher. It's empty now. Nothing left but dust. But it's less than half the room. There's a wall built there. Where? In front of us. The two great windows beyond that. They look down on the garden, but this wall... I don't know where it came from. 
Or when it was built. Or why? There's no door in it. It's papered all the way across. My candle blew out. My lantern's still lit. And look, there, where the wind tore the paper off the wall, there's a door. Don't go in there, Miss Susan. I have to. This is what she's been calling me to do. Oh, my God. What is it? Look. On the bed. <gasps> it's... It's Miss Rachel's room. Just as it was. And that's her. Just as she was. Oh, the good Lord protect us. How could she still be alive after 15 years? I knew you'd come. I knew you'd come. Take me to the grave so I can sleep at last. Oh, my darling, I can't believe it. When Mr. Hughes and I came home in that wind and couldn't find you, I thought I'd lose my mind. I imagined all kinds of things, but nothing like this. Is she alive? No. She's dead. And she has been all these years. But it's not possible. Fifteen years. You can't preserve a corpse. How? Excuse me, Dr. Fleming. What, Mr. Hughes? Believe me, I had no idea. I knew how Carson and Sarah worshipped the child, but I never dreamed of a love as sick as this. This was their way of keeping her for the rest of their lives, preserved, so that they could never lose her. But how? I'm a banker. I can't tell you. But a room hermetically sealed in all Carson's skills. I told you he was a taxidermist. But I never did get a chance to tell you. He ended up his life here in this city as our undertaker. A grisly ending to a weird story. And yet, a happy one. Rachel Huntington was finally laid to her rest alongside the man who might have been her husband. Huntington House was cleared of all shadows and became the nucleus of one of the country's finest hospitals, renowned for the miracles it achieves in saving life rather than preserving the illusion of it. I'll be back shortly. lovely sound, the tinkle of a music box, and yet hearing one, I tend to shudder, picturing that long dead girl, her eyes open in an unwinking stare, and the voice that never could speak in life, crying out in desperation for peace, never to be heard till at last came Susanna with her gift of perception. Our cast included Don Scardino, Jada Rowland, Stats Cotsworth, Ann Petoniak, and Robert Maxwell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. You haven't told me why you think you were in the garage tampering with the brakes. Why would you want to kill yourself, Olivia? I didn't want to kill myself. Then why did you deliberately ruin the brakes? That should have been a sure way to end your life. I know that hill leading down from the house. Doctor, it was only by chance, a fluke, that I was driving the car. If I fixed those brakes because I wanted to kill someone, then that someone is John. I hardly ever drive the car. John, I, I can't believe that you would want to kill John. Why would I go to all that trouble to kill myself? Surely I could think of easier ways to die. Olivia... Do you really want to kill John? Yes. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Join us.
this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you've enjoyed this and want to hear more, please subscribe to